Uh, I just wanted to, to start today with an acknowledgement of, of, um, of where we are, that we are meeting on the, the Gadigal people's lands of the Eora Nation, and as the traditional owners of this land, pay respects to the elders past and present and emerging. For those of you who don't know, my name is Andy Muir, and I'm on the, the, uh, the BAD board. And today, I'm really delighted to welcome you all here to the Dixon Room where uh, we will be having a fantastic discussion with these three authors about three very different books. I know we often kind of say at oh, the start of the panel, we go, three really different books, but this one really is three different books. We have a, um, we have a, a true history, we have a historical crime fiction, and we have a contemporary crime inspired by a key piece of, from our history. So these are really quite diverse uh, subjects to be trying to match together and mash up so I hope that you all think really hard and come up with some really great questions towards the end of the session. And for those of you who are on Zoom, you will have a chance to also ask those questions. Just pop them into the Q&A box and uh, we'll hopefully get to them to the, uh, the end of the session. Uh, before we kick off though, I do have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Please uh, mute your mobile phones, don't record the session. If you are taking photos, just turn off your flash because it can be a bit distracting for us up on stage. But feel free to share anything on social media using at Bad Crimes Sydney or hashtag Bad Crimes Sydney. Uh, and as I said, we will have about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So um, if you are, uh, you know, jotting down some notes, try and think of some good, good curly ones for us. So as I said, we have three uh, really fantastic authors with us today. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Meg Foster. Uh, she is an award-winning historian, specialising in Australia's settler colonial history, which you have to be careful of because settler colonialism is also a theoretical framework, so you sort of have to be careful when you say that. But she's also interested in banditry and public history. Uh, she's also a research fellow at uh, Newham College at the University of Cambridge, but she's joining us today to talk about her book. We also have uh, in the centre here Ben Hobson. Ben Hobson's book is uh, The Death of John Lacey. It's Ben's third book. Uh, he's first to become a whale, and then the follow-up, which was probably another standalone, was Snake Island. Uh, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I see them as exploring masculinity and the idea of maleness, which is quite, um, quite an interesting sort of subject to be tackling this, in this time. He's also the host of Ben's book club, uh, which you can access through your local library's Libby app through Overdrive. And he has the podcast, Burgers, Beers and Books, which you haven't tuned into, is, uh, is quite a hoot. And then last but not least is Felicity McLean. Her debut fiction, The Van Apfel Girls Are Gone, internationally exploded with nominations for a Dagger Award in the UK and a David Award here, as well as a whole lot of shortlists around the globe. Her second fiction is Red, uh, and that will be what we'll be talking about today. So please uh, just welcome those guests while I um, shuffle my papers. <laughs> now, for those of you who've read the blurb, we are here to discuss uh, Australia's colonial legacies, uh, and especially our fascination with bushrangers. Now, these three books, as I said, they're all very different, uh, and um, it's going to be, you know, an interesting conversation. So the first com the question that I have for the panel is um, what is a bushranger? I thought, Meg, you're probably the best qualified to at least tackle this one. The only officially qualified, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems like a really simple question, but to be honest, it is very difficult historically to pinpoint what a bushranger is. I think all of us in our head have an idea. We usually see a man on a horse with a gun who's robbed some people. Um, but really, bushranging changes over time. It's not static. Our first bushrangers were convicts who ran away to live in the bush. We had another wave of convictism with the gold rush. I'm sorry, bushranging with the gold rush. And then finally, we've got someone like Meg Kelly who really comes in quite late in the picture. Um, so that's kind of a very brief outline, but typical historians answer it's a lot more complicated than it seems at first glance. Did you want to kind of add to well that, I, uh, the non-historical response? The thing is, I, ca I don't know whether I can um, add to that because I just have such a broad idea of what bushranging is. I am coming from it from a, from a filmic reference or, you know, stories in Australia's history. So I do think of the Ned Kellys, I think of the Wild West, I think of 
gunmen and stagecoach robberies and got the neckerchief things over the front of their faces. So um, I don't know about a lot of the real history of bushranging and part of writing history, Australian history, is I get to actually read about these real people and I get to find out about their real lives and it was just such a, an interesting time in our, in our history. Um, but yeah, bushranging for me is just that very, it's very mythic to me. Because mm. we do seem to have, uh, you know, this unquestionable you know, fascination with them um, and we do sort of see waves of interest over time as well. But what, um, what draws you, you three to uh, the, the concept of a bushranger? I mean, uh, Felicity, I was kind of thinking particularly with you, you with, your, with this question because you've, you've re referenced Ned Kelly with your work. Yes, yeah, so my novel is a very loose, really, really loose retelling of the Ned Kelly story where Ned Kelly is now a red-headed teenage girl living on the central coast of New South Wales. So when I say loose, I mean really loose. Um, and why I chose to do that was because I wanted to explore this question of what in 2023 makes us so fascinated with bushrangers still? Why do we think that Ned Kelly is sort of this emblem of the most Australian, you know, it, this is us, isn't it? You, you know, it's the Olympic, Meg writes about this so eloquently in the beginning of her book. It's the Olympics and we need to wheel out a symbol of Australia and we wheel out Ned Kelly. Why is that, that that is how we see ourselves still in 2023? And so I thought I would take this very sacred cow and turn him into a her to see if I could unpick that a little bit. What is it that makes us really identify with Ned Kelly? Would we feel the same about a feisty, angry, furious female? Would we still identify with this person? Would we perhaps judge her more harshly than we would judge a male that goes around toting guns? Would we, how would we feel about this and what would that say about us as a nation and our interest in Ned Kelly? Have you had much feedback on that question? I did wonder if I'd get some very angry letters um, and I haven't, which is a relief. But we really, I mean, we really are, I was watching 7.30 last week and there was a whole section of the program dedicated to was this maybe or maybe not Steve Hart's cult revolver? And at the end of th this investigation, they decided probably it wasn't. But that was still worthy of, you know, a good five or ten minutes on 7.30 current affairs that perhaps it could have been maybe. Sorry, I just wanted to kind of jump in there. One thing that I think about when I think about bush rangers and something that has come to me as I've spoken more and more about the book is that idea of bush rangers and injustice. So the idea is that bush rangers are somehow suffering oppression or prejudice in the case of the bush rangers who are people of colour in my book and they're fighting back. And I think that that idea of injustice and the symbolism behind that is what's really powerful. Um, and speaking to Felicity's book, I found it really interesting that Red deliberately doesn't steal. She doesn't rob, she uses money, and she's got this idea that she's almost got like a code, that she's kind of got this that honour among thieves type thing. And I think, Ben, that through line of injustice and kind of being, bush rangers are meant to be forced into it. It's kind of the mythic, legendary status behind the symbol we see today. Of course, real bush rangers often robbed because they need to survive, they weren't particularly discerning as to whether they robbed from poor people or women, um, so mm. they, they didn't actually stick to that code, but sometimes when they got before the courts, they really tried to make out that they had because they wanted that popular support. And so, in some ways, the legend, that symbol that we have that's so powerful today has its roots in real bushrangers trying to cultivate this persona, this mystique around themselves. Do you guys think that with Australian bushrangers that they are in our culture valorised? That they are they are heroic totems of this is what Australia this is good Australia this is the best version of ourselves? Or is it sorry I'm taking questions? <laughs> or is it more that it's just an because I think about this is it's more just their figments of interest and because it's set so far in the past it's like we can kind of remove ourselves from the immediacy of them 
Because if, if a bush ranger walked in here right now, I don't think we'd see them as a hero or a conquering hero. But I was, yeah, what do you guys think? I think there's definitely a sort of underdog, larrikin element to it. You know, this is how we like to see ourselves. And you just need to watch the cricket over summer. And when we're playing against England, people will turn up, Australians will turn up dressed as Ned Kelly. Because we are the larrikin underdog who doesn't like authority and we like to see ourselves that way, yeah. whether or not we actually are. Yeah, that's a good point. I was, well, that's what I was thinking with my, with my book too, is that the guy, John Lacey, my book's called The Death of John Lacey, and he's purposefully like what you were just describing. He isn't sort of born out of oppression. He's not born out of this desperation. He's born out of greed and he's born out of desire for power. And he's quite a, a calculating, greedy person in that way. But I guess that's bucking the sort of mythic idea of what maybe that's what I was doing with my book. <laughs> well, it's actually. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a nice little segue to, to my, the question I had here, which was, um, you know, what is it that's kind of drawing you to, the, to explore this, um, the past? You know, why do you keep on going back to, to reinterrogate these, these things? I think my main fascination with, with this idea of Australian history is, I don't know how this sounds either, but it, it's such a, it's a, it's a, it winnows things down. And I think this is what good crime writing does as well, is it just really becomes about life and death and the consideration of what that means and the desperation of that. Um, I just think in our modern day, it's just very easy to get very cluttered and busy and we often just have thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And there's this great appeal to me about going into our history with, it sort of focuses our attention on what truly matters to us and I also think that history and this type of desperation, it poses for me really interesting questions because I'm all, I really, if you try to place yourself back in history, and I think it's really easy for us to be judgmental of people in history and to think, well, I wouldn't do that. You know, I'm a moral person. I wouldn't treat people that way. It's very easy to do that, but it's, I think it's very difficult to face the idea that you might have done some things that you would, that were immoral, that went against your own principles. And I often think, you know, if my, if my neighbour baked a pie and put it on their windowsill, I'm not going to go and take that pie. I don't steal, right? But if my kids were hungry, I might look twice at the pie. And then if my kids were starving, I would probably go and take it from my neighbour, right? And then what if my neighbour tried to stop me? What would, I, what would I do? What would any of us do in that situation? And I don't... That's what fiction, I think, can do really well, is explore those questions and then rooting that in history. It sort of it allows us to, to narrow down to those desperate situations. Yeah. So, I mean, that's human nature and that's kind of exploring, you know, human responses to a situation. When you're looking at, at, at the past, the social constructs have changed... You know, how do you sort of deal with those you know, uh, questions of language, questions around, um, uh, you know, the role of, of, of women, minorities? Um, I read a lot of, I mean, <laughs> I don't read, <laughs> Meg reads a lot, I don't read. <laughs> uh, Nelly is close to as much as Meg reads, but um, uh, yeah, it was just all reading. Um, I did work with um, a Wadarung artist, so my book is located in Ballarat on the goldfields. And that's on Wadarung country. And so I made contact with uh, an Aboriginal elder named uh, Marlene in the area. And so I worked firsthand with her about um, just cultural notions back then and representative viewpoints from, from that time, which I don't have um, access to, obviously. Uh, and then it was, there were a lot of books that I read and a lot of books that Marlene recommended. And there were also books Marlene said probably don't read those ones, mm -hmm. which was interesting. Uh, but there was one book that was for language specifically. It was called Gold, Gold, Gold. And it was, it was just a dictionary of words that the mining town of Ballarat, the tent village of Ballarat, would actually use. And it just had excerpts from journals. And it was, yeah, it was just... It felt like I stumbled, you know, I don't mean the pun, onto gold when I found that because it was just being littering those things throughout the dialogue. It just made it... It evoked so much. Mm -hmm. 
How about you, um, Felicity? In sort of translating a, uh, a story from the past to the present, how did you? What did you have to change to make it contemporary? Language was actually where I started with this. So, I read Peter Carey's True History of the Kelly Gang, which is fabulous. It's really fabulous, and. It is written in this urgent stream of conscious, you know, barely any punctuation manner. And I thought, that's interesting. I wonder why. And went back to the original source of Ned Kelly's Gerildry Letters, which is, I've had a look today. It's in the bookshop. Go and buy it. It is one of the greatest pieces of writing, I think, in Australian history. It is terrific. It is emotive. It is full of the most fabulous turns of phrases and, you know, my... This is Ned Kelly writing. My fist came into collision with the policeman's nose and, you know, he's describing the cops, calling them fat-necked, wombat-legged sons of English landlords. Like, it is passion on a page, which was just so much fun to read and that's where I started. I really thought, wow, I wonder if I could recreate something like this that is passionate and stream of conscience. It's a real manifesto, mm -hmm. which is what I wanted to create, sort of a warrior's polemic. So this, my book is similar in that it has very little punctuation. It is um, very much a warrior's polemic, much like the Jewelry Letters, which is just such a fantastic piece of writing. Yeah, we'll come back to, to voice, because I think it's a really interesting question for all three of you. But um, Meg, did you want to kind of respond to that as well? Because the colonial record um, presents a lot of very challenging language and identifications. So how do you sort of work around r around that, that language? Um, language is a really interesting question. Um, and just going to the, the issue of dialogue and words that people actually use to speak to one another. Um, my, bush ra my bush ranging book is a book about people of colour who have been written out of the bush ranging mythology, who we don't really know about. So I talk about an African American man, a Chinese man, and two Aboriginal bush rangers. So I'm sitting here very jealous of these two fiction writers being able to speak to dialogue because the people I'm looking at have been written out of the record so thoroughly. We really only have kind of court documents that have quite her seemingly dry, seemingly objective language, this person is convicted of this crime, for instance. How do you rehumanize that? How do you bring back the person that this record is actually speaking about? How do you motion to something about their own perspective, the way they saw themselves, the world that they lived in, not only the physical world and the interactions with other people, but their cultural world? So, in the case of the Chinese bushranger Sam Pu, I try to look at, well, what is the Chinese outlaw tradition? And it goes back well beyond ours. It goes back to the, the 12th century. Um, and so language for me with historical sources, I can't play with it in the same types of ways, but I try to get around it in different ways. And part of that is being very aware that what is on the page is not as solid, is not as direct root line to the past as it appears, it's not as encompassing. We need to actually work around that to fill in those gaps. Mm. That, was, that was another uh, question I was going to ask, is, you know, the difficulty of absence in the record, where you know you're absolutely certain that something will have happened, yet you, uh, you put all the bits together and you just know that that person was in a particular place or did something, but there's no record to confirm it. I mean, your whole book is about these absences and, and re returning people to the narrative. I mean, what sort of work were you doing to, to enable that? Yeah, so in some instances, it's taking something and trying to expand upon it. So once again, to use um, Sam Poo as an example, in one jail register, it says he's from um, Amoy, which is in the Fujian province of China. Um, and that that's one tiny detail, but it really just exploded a whole range of possibilities for how I could actually access his life and his life story. So the bush rangers I look at are very different to the ones we're used to in that no one has bothered to look at their upbringing. No one has bothered to look at what led them to that point where they enter the crime archive. And in many instances, no one's thought to challenge the idea that they were actually criminals, which spoiler alert, I go on to show that some of them mm. actually weren't. They didn't actually do the crimes they're convicted and in turn executed in one instance of committing. 
Um, so that detail of the Fujian province of China and this place called Amoy really just overturned a lot of ideas that later writers in like the 1900s and through to the 1950s had about this man. He, Sam Poo was meant to have come over as a greedy gold miner and he decides that bushranging is a lot easier than gold mining. Um, that detail of Amoy in the Fujian province actually showed that he came over decades prior as an indentured laborer. He had a completely different set of experiences. He could speak a different dialect of Chinese to these gold mining Chinese men who came afterwards. Um, and so then I could actually say, well, what is happening in Amoy at this time? What home would he have left? How could he have come to Australia? Um, and so that's one example of how something that seems like quite a small detail can actually kind of provide insight into a whole world that previously was just an absence. So the, the, uh, the two creative writers on the panel, does that process sound familiar of finding a tiny detail and then extrapolating? It, I, I think it does for sure and you find one word in like my gold, gold, gold book and it just sets off this whole chain reaction of wow that could mean this. And, but I also have the luxury of just being able to make it up as I go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I have, I did once, I did once get an email from, I just, from To Become a Whale, my first book, which was set on the Morton Island whaling station, I got an email once from a, a, a reader, and it said that I'd referenced cling wrap, and it was in, my book set in 1961, and cling wrap didn't come into Australia until 1963, so you've really mucked it up there, yeah. buddy. Lost the reader right there. So I do have luxuries, but <laughs> I do get angry emails sometimes. Um, you, do, you do try to stick with the facts as much as you can. But at the same time, I think it's our job to... I'm not presenting history in a way where it, it's rooted specifically at that time. I just It's impossible for me. It's more like I'm a writer writing now, imagining what life would have been like back then. Um, and there are some modern sensibilities that you try to sort of subtly weave in there, as in you're sort of behind the narrative presenting this, as in I don't agree with what's happening here sort of stuff. That stuff's very difficult and tricky to do. Um, yeah, hope that answers the question. <laughs> do you have anything to, to add? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not really writing historical fiction per se. Um, really? Although you are writing it is, 30 years ago. Yeah, it is set a little while ago, but I was still alive then, so I don't see it as like really, I didn't have to dig through the archives to find out what was happening in the it's 1990s. History, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I can, I can pretty much fact check the things that I'm writing myself, sadly. Um, but yeah, I, I would find anything before my time where I really did have to dig through the archives incredibly overwhelming and perhaps I would disappear down rabbit holes. I know my personality type, I would disappear down rabbit holes and I would be looking up archival images of cling wrap for days, perhaps weeks. I would get nowhere so deliberately I have stuck with things where I can verify the facts to within reason myself. I think that the research rabbit hole is very dangerous. It's also very... In, it, it's, <laughs> well, it's, I find it intimidating. Because I'll be writing a scene and then my person will walk through a doorway and I'm like, did they have screen doors back then? <laughs> like, why, surely... That's when you ring out. Meg. That's <laughs> when I'm going to now ring Meg. That's why I wanted to jump in and say, as an historian reading Ben's book, what I think it does really beautifully is that that feel of the past, the texture, those kind of visceral embodied elements that sometimes you <laughs> don't get reading some type of flat historical document. The world building, the texture, the smells, the, the mud, the rain, like that type of thing, I just thought was so beautifully done. And that could have been I something can't even extracted believe, from This is the best moment of my life. I'm not <laughs> kidding. <laughs> it's being recorded. <laughs> Such respect you can watch for you. it back later. Uh, can I watch it back? <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, that, that's, yeah, that's huge. I, um, I really do, I really do, I would worry about it. I guess would be what I would say. I really lab maybe labour labour over that specific thing, but it is one of the things with my book too that I struggled with was that I I wrote 
for the first time in my life, I wrote a, a grant application. Do you guys write grant applications? I've, I've this was the yeah. first time I did it. And I was really nervous for travel grant to actually go down to Ballarat and to experience the gold fields and to meet Marlene and to do things like that. And um, I sent in my grant application in February of 2020. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't get to go. And that was the main thing that I was worried about was the texture of the mud and the touch of the trees and the smells. Like I, I was really concerned about doing that well because um, it was all from books and it was all from talking with Marlene. Um, and I only got to meet her for the first time when I had a finished book to hand her. Um, yeah, well, so I was a bit devastated with that. Mm. So thank, <sighs> thank you, I was very happy. <laughs> I, that's, um, I'll kind of jump ahead a couple of questions there because you, you touched on there, you, you do consult with the Wadawurrung, I think I'm getting that right, people. Yeah. Can you explain that process? Because that's something that often gets forgotten uh, when we're kind of exploring the past. Yeah, it was, so I sort of, I sort of accidentally fell into writing this, this part of Australian history because I'd originally envisaged writing an Australian Western, because I just love Westerns so much. I'm from Australia, so I thought I can't write an American Western, I have to write an Australian um, Western. And it was as I was reading about it and starting to really get into where the, it was set, I was, I'll be honest, I was trying to avoid talking about the Wadarung, talking about Aboriginal history, simply not because I didn't want to, it was just because I felt inadequate and I couldn't do it. I felt inept, I wasn't prepared, I didn't know how to write that history. I don't know whether I still know how, but it was um, sending an email through to the Wadarung people. Um, they have a council down there, Council of Arts. And I sent through this email and I felt a bit rude sending the email, like I'm asking for more from these First Nations people, you know. But Marlene, as soon as she got my email, was just so enthusiastic and happy and, she, sorry, I shouldn't say got my email. Her son um, printed my email off because she doesn't know how to work computers, Marlene. Um, but she very, very graciously answered all my questions. I had multiple phone calls with her. And one of the very generous things she did was read a first early draft of the book and she actually helped craft a few different important parts. She gave me a few Wadarung words to sprinkle in here and there. And she actually helped craft the ending of the book. Because uh, my books tend to be very um, gritty and dealing with big weighty themes. So the ending of the book sort of went like this. But because of Marlene, it sort of went like that a little bit. She was like, I really want to add that little bit of hope at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really happy to place that in there. But the book wouldn't exist without her help. And it was, it was just such an enriching process. Um, and I, I kept on trying to send her money because, you know, it's through the council. So I said, well, uh, you know, this is a rate I'm paying you for an hour's worth of work. This is your knowledge. No, no, no. So I, <laughs> I gave her a copy of the book when signed it to her, and that was all she wanted. But then she also made me a cup of tea and gave me cake, so I, I still owe her, I think. <laughs> She's still, I'm still indebted to Marlene. So Check her out her website, by the way. Marlene Gilson, brilliant um, Aboriginal artist in Australia. She's, her work's been in, on the Sydney Opera House projected. Like she's, I was actually in the, pros, like the presence of royalty talking to her, and I had no clue mm. um, until I looked it up later. So it's, it sounds like it's a process you would go through again. Yes, um, I think so. I think so. It, it was very rewarding and I would love to work with Marlene again. I would like to actually work and actually get to go on country for, the f for a book that I'm working on. Um, maybe I will return to the gold fields, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, was there any consultation with your um, work, maybe particularly with the, like the, the uh, Governor Brothers or...? Yeah, so um, I was in touch with one of Waramai um, Aboriginal Bushranger Marianne Bugg's descendants, mm -hmm. Lorraine Martin. Um, it was kind of a chance encounter. We had a mutual friend who put us in touch and 
Her story is really interesting because through speaking with her, I realised that she had only recently discovered she was descended from this particular Aboriginal bushranger. And for her, that was also the first time she realised she had Aboriginal ancestry. The family story going down was that she actually had an ancestor who was Maori. And so then that actually becomes a part of the chapter on Marianne Bug herself because Marianne in her own times in the 19th century starts this myth that she is in fact Maori as opposed to Aboriginal. Um, and that in itself opens up so many more doors. Why would this have happened? Why would someone who was so famous in her own time for being an Aboriginal um, outlaw say later in life that she is in fact Maori? Um, and there are a few different reasons for that. Maori people were always higher esteemed in European eyes in Australia than Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people historically have been seen on the lowest rungs of the racial hierarchy in colonial minds. Maori people had recognised forms of agriculture and government and warfare that Europeans could instantly identify. Um, but also this becomes a story about the stolen generations as well. Because there's increasing government intervention into Aboriginal people's lives at the end of Marianne Bug's life. And by claiming Maori ancestry before that tide had completely turned, it's very likely she actually saved her quite extensive family from being taken. And so there's quite a long history and a long legacy um, of this particular bushranger's life. And it was really incredible to speak to Lorraine about the impact that had on her and her family history and her sense of identity as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating when you kind of see the way the Maori people are treated. I mean, even I think at the first government house, there was a party of Maori that were brought across as guests, mm. but there weren't any First Nation people from here that were guests in, gov in the first government house. Anyway, uh, moving, moving on. As I said, we were going to talk about voice and, and Felicity. I wanted to really touch on the, the strength of the voice of Red. And I wondered how, um, whether that voice came easily or how you kind of managed to, um, to create it. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I find with any fiction I'm writing that I can't really get anywhere until I've got voice right. So it doesn't matter what I think I'm writing or where, you know, I can plot as much as I like, but until I've got voice right, then I'm really not getting anywhere. I'm just making notes or writing things that won't end up in the final copy. So it wasn't until that voice, you know, I had that voice clear in my head that I could really get going. Um, yeah, I think I wanted a voice that was pretty outspoken, pretty feisty, very Australian. I wanted it to be quite a rollicking kind of novel. Mm -hmm. the, my previous novel was quite dreamy and having spent so long writing that and then promoting that, I was ready for a change of pace. Yep. So Red was good fun. Mm, quite a lot of energy. Yeah. So, are you a, a writer who I'm quite envious of um, that kind of says, oh, the, the character was talking to me and telling me he not, I did, they didn't want to do this and do that? And, or uh, yes, I feel like that. It's, mm. yeah, I mean, it, that sounds like I'm really channeling somebody and I just need to sit down at the keys and it all comes out and it's so very easy. It's not, it's much less glamorous or interesting than that. It's more bricklaying I feel like like it's sentence by sentence but mm -hmm. yes definitely unless you've got the voice right I personally can't get anywhere without that yeah. and I find even if you know how people say are you a plotter or a pantser do you fly by the seat of your pants it doesn't matter how much I like to plot I never stick to it I can draw yeah. elaborate you know great big sweeping murals of plot and I get a chapter in and think oh no I feel like going this way or the character yeah feels, you know, it feels much more natural to go this way. So mm. I'm definitely character-led, not plot-led. Yeah. And, and how about you, you Ben? Because you've got, I think, six different ca main characters, would you say? You've got the two brothers, you've got Lacey, you've got yeah. the Reverend. I've got, th I think, three point-of-view characters. Yeah. But then, yeah, there are some tertiary characters who are pretty centre, yeah. Yeah. How do you go about managing those different voices? The, there's a there's a lot of different things that I always think about before I start 
writing. And I, I agree, I think voice is one of the primary things to get before I start, I kick off. Um, I'm certainly not a writer who, who feels like their characters speak to them. Um, the way I view writing is I try to write so quickly that I'm not thinking. <laughs> That's the <laughs> sentence. <laughs> um, no, because I, when, I th when I think, especially when I, th when, I th when I think, I'm overthinking. And as soon as I start to overthink and over fudge and over elaborate and use fancy words and put all my, you know, things that I can put in there, it feels fake. It feels like I'm putting a bunch of glitter and crap onto a cake and it's not the actual heart of it. It's just a bunch of glitter and crap. And so if I can write quickly enough and get out of my own way and just be as simple and direct as possible, that's my aim, and that's, that's what I was doing with John Lacey. I was trying to be that direct. I had a couple of rules as well. I wasn't allowed to internalize anything, so I didn't want to give any internal thoughts to people. Again, because I don't know how many of the people in 19th century Australia were really thinking about why they were motivated to do the things they mm -hmm. were doing. They would just do the things. Um, and then it's a process of actually this, I don't know whether I'm going to sound like a, uh, an insane person, but I, I try to... It's a safe space? It's a safe yeah, space. safe space. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's about... I actually feel like I'm acting. And so when I have a scene with multiple characters, it is like improvised theatre that I am acting all the scene people at once and I type quickly enough so that the arguments go back and forth and feel like real arguments versus trying to think what an argument would be like, trying to get at what they feel like. If I think, I'm not feeling as much. That was a long, elaborate thing, but that's, I, I that's think, me. I yeah. think I'm going to need to think on that because it's sort of... <laughs> but it's, um, I'm like, I, as long as the characters have distinct points of view that I can really understand and get their motivation, having a conversation and play acting as two different people who have both valid points, it makes for a really interesting dramatic scene. Whereas if I'm trying to craft that and come up with it on my own, it's just going, to me, it feels very flat when I read it back. Mm. Um, but those awkward avenues that you'll find a character going, kind of like, why are you talking about that? That I often think of um, Bob Dylan's singing, because he can't really sing. You guys, who likes Bob Dylan? Because I, lo yeah, I love Bob Dylan, <laughs> but the thing I like about him is that he always sounds honest it's always a bit rough and it's always a bit awkward at points and he doesn't quite hit the timing correctly but that sort of awkwardness makes it feel more real. So does that mean there's a lot of editing if you're sort of... Oh yeah, yes, yeah. there's a lot of editing. Mm. But that first draft from the gut hopefully has a semblance of um, feeling in it and so then you can put those craft things in and, and exaggerate certain things and bring other things to the surface that you liked about that first draft. But if that first thing doesn't have feeling in it, I get... It just... I feel, like, I feel like I'm putting on a show. and I feel like I'm dressing up, whereas that's not naturally me. And so it's always about trying to get into the subconscious of what makes me tick. And so that's where sometimes when I get asked about my novels being about masculinity, which you were talking about a little bit earlier, I'm not consciously doing that, but it's obviously something that's preoccupying some part of me. Mm. Meg, how do you sort of tackle the, the question of, of voice and style? Because it's so easy for history just to be a series of facts and very dry, but you sort of, yours is it's quite engaging. It's not, it's not quite conversational, but it's, it's, it's almost sort of conversational in its style. Thank you. That's a big compliment. Um, one of the things I really try to do with my work is take the reader with me each step of the way. So even in instances, like I will write in third person about something happening, but because of the nature of the history I'm writing, because I'm writing about these four individual figures who haven't really been looked at before and who are deliberately erased in different ways from the archive that we have, basically this is kind of like a bit of a, a kind of detective thing. So we've got the evidence, we've got the colonial evidence, and so, each chapter very deliberately starts with, this is what the colonists thought, this is the narrative they have, this is what they said about these people. And it seems really tight 
but I deliberately write it kind of tight so then I can go, but actually, what is really happening? Let's go on a journey together and actually see what is the evidence to back this claim up? What is, was this person really here? What did this person commit the murder they're accused of actually committing? And let's forensically go back through and try to piece that together. And I very, I use we quite a bit in those sections of the book because I want the reader to feel like we're going through this process together. And I want, I don't want to be, you know, the great mystical Oz behind the curtain. I want to show exactly what the sources are, exactly how I'm interpreting them. So then the reader can kind of gauge for themselves, yeah, that's compelling, or mm, I would have actually maybe seen it this way. And so I think that's where there's like an, an ethics to doing history about real people. I can't just make stuff up. There are, these are real human beings I'm writing about and also a lot of them still have descendants as well. So I have an ethical obligation as an historian to be as honest and upfront as possible about what I'm writing, how I'm writing it. Um, and that doesn't mean that my narrative, that means my narrative isn't as, as seamless as these two lovely books, but it, it also hopefully does show something about that process of how do we know the past? How do we think we know about it? And how can we actually challenge some of those assumptions that maybe we weren't even conscious of going in? This is a nerdy history question. Do you have a favourite type of record to work with? Mine's returns. I mean, the ones that were the most <laughs> extensive were the crime records. So things like depositions. Um, so you've got witnesses coming up and saying what happened. Um, but for me, it's those little, those little details like the ones I was mentioning before, the, the records that seem kind of obscure or you might get one tiny piece of information from them but they can open different worlds. So um, I use crime records most extensively but yeah, it's the, the nitty gritty kind of serendipitous records that I like the best, mm. I think. For those that don't know, a return is a very bureaucratic document where they list everything. So you can go to a particular region of the state where the police officers were and you'll get uh, every single financial statement for horse saddles and how much the horses cost to be shooed in the month of February. They're incredibly detailed um, and bizarre records from, uh, from our past. But anyway, that's a little bit of an aside. Um, so. Felicity, we know we've, you've gone to the, uh, the Gerildery record. Um, that kind of encountering of a, of a real voice is quite incredible. Um, how, do you remember the first time you sort of decided, oh, I'm going to go and, and look at that? I'm going to explore it a bit in, in a bit more depth. It was after I'd read the Peter Carey novel and I thought, where has, where has this come from? What's its origin story? And that's how I stumbled upon the letter. And, you know, I had learned about Ned Kelly and bush ranging in colonial history at school. I had never come across that letter before. Um, and I just... It was the voice that leapt off the page. Really, really, it was like you had the person standing there reading out their version of events. And this was a very aggrieved, let me tell you what really happened before I hang... Um, although it was written slightly earlier than that. It was 1879, I think. 79, I think. But, yeah, this was a, an angry, outraged voice leaping off the page. And from there, I did a bit of reading about Ned Kelly's life and really used the facts very much as scaffolding or lily pads. So there were things I learned about Ned Kelly's life. I didn't know, for instance, that he, as a small child had rescued a drowning boy in a river nearby. He was on his way to school, someone was drowning in the river and by all accounts he threw his shoes off, jumped in, didn't think anything for his own life and saved this kid in the river and it was the local publican's child, I think. And Ned Kelly was given a green sash as his reward and apparently he was so very proud of this green sash the historians here can verify if this is true for me, but he was wearing it at towards the... And even I, I heard underneath his armour, I don't know if it's true, but it's a very good story, that he was really proud of this moment early on in his life and this green sash he was given as a reward. So in my book, the main character, Ruby, saves someone from drowning and is given a book that is bound and it's a green-bound book. So that was that's the way I use sort of these 
elements from Ned Kelly's yeah. life really lo- like you could honestly read Red and not know that it was based on Ned Kelly and it would still hopefully hold together as a narrative. But those I I loved those facts from his life that I didn't know before and use those as kind of lily pads to prolong the plot. Yeah. I haven't heard of, of plotting in terms of lily pads before, but I like that, that image. That's really nice. Now, I can see that the, uh, the volunteers are, are shuffling around the room um, with a microphone in hand, so question time is coming up very quickly. But I just had another question that I wanted to ask the panel, and that was, like, who, who were you influenced by in your writing? I mean, I've got a suspicion about a couple of you, but I'd like to sort of hear what... We want your suspicions first, please. Nope. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first because I interrupted you. Um, my uh, big fan of uh, Hemingway would be one of my go-to guys. Richard Flanagan in Australia would be a, a, a favourite. And um, I loved the Peter Carey book as well. Um, and Cormac McCarthy would be probably my... Like, I find it absolutely incredible that that man existed at all, um, that his work has probably meant the most to me um, over the course of my life, for sure. Don't ever hope to be close to what he does, but he's my guy. Mm-hmm. Maybe Felicity? Um, I really like the work of Ingla Clendenin. So she does yep. hopefully what I'm trying to do, so kind of recreates past worlds, takes the reader by the hand, takes them on a journey... Um, Greg Denning also kind of, they were friends, so it kind of makes sense. I like both of them. Um, But Grace Carskins as well is someone I really love. And I was lucky enough to have her as my PhD supervisor as well. So it's one of those ones where you read someone and then you meet them and they're even better than (laughs) than what you (laughs) thought in real life. So those are my three. Yeah, I have to admit I had read True Grit uh, before I started working on Red. That was a fantastic read. I'm a huge fan of Colin McCann, the Irish-American author. He is just lyrical and eloquent and amazing and I would read anything that Colin McCann wrote. Have you read his book on writing? Yes, Isn't I that have. Good? Yeah, that's quite dog-eared at times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we can probably open up to the floor. Have we got any, any questions? Mm. Oh, over here. Remember, if you are on Zoom, to type your question into the Q&A box for us. Hey, I was interested in what you were saying about location, and particularly when you talked about being on on country. Uh, I was accused of being a lazy writer a while ago because I was using Google Maps to uh, research a location. How important is it to you when you're thinking about location to actually be there as opposed to kind of it all coming from here? Does it make a difference to the quality of the writing? Well, I mean, from my story earlier, I actually wasn't able to be um, on country. I wasn't able to get there in person. And from all accounts, everybody reading it has said, I've done a really good job with it. But I think it feels different to me. Like, I think I would have liked... I don't know how it would be different, but it might have just had a little bit of a different detail to it that perhaps um, you can't read about, because it is about that experience. Um, My first book to become a whale was set on Morton Island Whaling Station. And I'm actually from um, Brisbane and I work on Bribie Island, so I can literally see Morton Island every day. But I was also a high school teacher with a young family working on this dream of being an author one day. And I'm not paying 200 bucks on this hobby. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like that's money my kids to feed. So I never went to the whaling station, even though it's right nearby. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and then I wrote the book and I always had in the back of my mind, I'll go there if, you know, you know, on the outside chance anything happens, I'll definitely go and make different details. But before I knew it, the book was coming out and I hadn't gone yet. And then people were asking me this question on panels. <laughs> and, um, oh, it was just about, you know, because it's supposed to be mythic, it's the boy thinking about the... the, the, the oh, yeah, 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 it's just fudged it. I should have gone. I think it's really important to have first-hand experience, if you can get it, of the places that you go to, yeah. Yeah, it was actually important for me as well, and you may not think that when it comes to history, but I think going to places where history happen, really, really important. Obviously, you need to be mindful that things change, even vegetation, obviously, environmental history is a whole discipline of its own. But for me, going and seeing things, um, there's one part in my book where I write about 
Jimmy Governor's family, they're, they're chained to each other and they're forced to walk from a place called Wallar into Mudgee. Driving from Wallar into Mudgee and being like, this is such a long distance for anyone to walk, especially in winter, chained to each other, going around the whole area where Jimmy Governor was operating and being like, wow, okay, so even the dust that caked his boots would have changed colour because of the immense distance that he travelled. So those types of little details, they give you a whole other sense that this is really something that happened. And so for me, going back to place is really important. Did you ever go to Woi Woi? I actually <laughs> have spent a long time, uh, a lot of my childhood on the Central Coast. My grandparents lived there, which was part of the appeal. This was like, you know, a summer holiday stomping ground. Um, also, I loved the fact that there are so many places on the Central Coast that have these Western names like San Remo and Wyoming and who was it? Well, like, was it a 10-year-old boy in the 1920s that was naming this after his cowboy heroes? Why, why all the references to the Westerns? And that was part of my questioning of why do we, you know, why do we think of ourselves as a nation full of underdog Ned Kellys? Also, is that any more us in 2023 than a Western or Greek myths? Because there's those in the book as well. How are we defining ourselves as a country and what does that say? But to go back to your question about location and being a lazy writer, I would argue that you're working twice as hard. Yeah, I wanted if to say that too. If you haven't been to the place and you're conjuring that up in your head, you are working very hard. <laughs> yeah. It's very easy. Oh, sorry, it's not easy. When you're writing, you will have a lot of people telling you about every single way you're doing everything wrong. You'll have a lot of people saying you're never going to do it, etc. But if you believe in it and you like it and it reads real to you, then, then that's the thing. Question over here. Yes. Um, I'll just wait for the, the microphone. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, I spent a fair bit of my life in the Northern Territory working on large cattle stations. Now, I haven't read your book, so you may cover some of this era, but I'm very interested in the era early in the, you know, turn of 19th to 20th century and break a Morant because every second station hand in the Northern Territory aspires to walk in the footsteps of break a Morant to be a horse like him, all that stuff. So I'm just curious whether a, fact, a figure like that was a figure in your consideration as well as the 1850s gold rush, the Ned Kellys, all those people as one of those other mythic uh, heroes of the Australian past. Uh, n no. <laughs> I think, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no. Uh, in even my book, I don't think I centre... It's... it's it tends to be one thing that sets off the rest of it. And my thing was this character of John Lacey. And then after that, it's just filling in everything else that surrounds that character. Um, but that's not to say that a, a person like that in, in the future might capture my interest. I've just now become interested in this guy named um, Dr. Charles Strong, who was uh, a reverend in this thing called the Australian Church. And I find his writing about pacifism in the early 20th century of Australia incredibly interesting. So you never know where an idea might come from. Mm. Uh, Meg, I don't know whether you wanted to talk to the, the Bushman myth, which Break Morant certainly fits into with the Bush Rangers. Well, I was going to kind of speak a bit more to like the, the skills with horsemanship. Yep. Um, because obviously earlier convict Bush Rangers, a lot of them didn't have horses. By the time you get to the 1850s and 60s, it's becoming a lot more of a thing for a Bush Ranger to have a horse. It's obviously a lot more easy to get away, but also the skills of horsemanship are a lot more associated with Bush Ranging by that time. And we can see that right up until like the 1920s and 30s, there's a woman, a white woman called Elizabeth Jessie Hickman, um, who's operating around kind of the um, like Ralston area of New South Wales. She previously rode in rodeo shows and then she has a gang of cattle duffers. But she is known as a bush ranger and in part that's because of her expert horse womanship. Um, and so by that point, bush rangering is more of a personality type and a set of skills than necessarily crime because she doesn't commit full-on robbery like because it needs the threat of violence for it to be robbery. She is a cattle duffer. Um, so it comes full circle. I see another hand. Yep. Suzanne. 
Thanks very much. That was really interesting. I'm interested in what you're doing next. I know perhaps Felicity's work best and um, the books are quite different. So what happens for each of you now, if you're happy to talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am writing a very contemporary novel at the moment. Um, it's very early stages yet. So sort of, you know, that first 20,000 words where you're fumbling in the dark, but that's where I'm at at the moment. But it is very contemporary. Uh, my next thing is Dr. Charles Strong and then um, what would happen if a pacifist got met with bush rangers is essentially the premise of my book because would his pacifism really hold up if he was threatened? You know what I mean? Um, but it's a, I'm really working on this thing. It's like a siege novel set in the 20th century and the thing about a siege novel, I've made myself this rule, I'm not allowed to leave this one property. So everything has to be contained and happen there. So if it happens off stage, I cannot write about it, which is really difficult to have the bush rangers travelling to this place because then they don't arrive there and start to go, hey, remember why we're here and unpacking their motivation. I'm having to work really hard around it. Um, but I'm finding that I love restraint, so I'm really enjoying Plus, you know, siege novels. Or see, I, I actually tried to find, are there other siege... You guys up the front can probably tell me. Are there these siege novels? Because um, I think filmically... So I think of Assault on Precinct 13. I think of um, The Thing. I think of um, Dog Day Afternoon. But I can't think of the same thing with books. And so I'm, that's why I'm writing it, because I wanted to read it, I guess. Um... I'm jealous of both Felicity and Ben because they've got a lot of projects on the go. My book took me 10 years to write, so mine won't be coming up very soon. I'm interested in the connections between bushranging and highway robbery in Britain because it's been assumed that convicts came over, they brought traditions of highway robbery with them, it just kind of seamlessly became bushranging, but it's actually not as clear-cut at all. Um, but I've actually just been employed at UTS for four years to do a job looking at how we remember and think of bushranging today. So that goes to one of the questions that's been a through line of this talk. How do we think of bushrangers? How do we remember them? Who's excluded? Um, do we think about people of colour, for instance? What about queer bushrangers? And what does that tell us about our current social attitudes to criminal justice? Who, who is justice for? Who is left out? Um, and how do we see ourselves as a society? So that's the, the bigger project. Mm. Uh, question down the front. Yeah, it's for me, and it, it picks up exactly on what you said. I once read um, a thesis that suggested that Ned Kelly was a bogan, and I think what the person was trying to do was to bring up to date the notion of the bush ranger and put it in a contemporary context. Um, what do you think of that proposition? Would you would you make that connection? I mean. I don't think it was a very good thesis. But it did pop into my head when you were talking about how we think about bushrangers now. Um, I, I mean, historically, obviously, it's an, an anachronism. Um, but what interests me is p what people's in is. What is their connection? What is that through line? What is the way that they make sense of it? And so in that sense, that would be really interesting evidence for me to try to unpack, OK, well, what does this person mean by Bergen? What are the connotations they're using? Um, it's actually pretty remarkable. There's some sociological evidence about bushranging and about just under 25% of us actually don't like Ned Kelly and he's associated with terms like thief, murderer. Um, and so seeing that there's like a broad range of experience and some of those negative connotations as well, one of the interesting ones that's come up a few times is larrikin mm -hmm. as well. Um, Larrikin meant something very different in the 19th century. We kind of think of it as someone who's, like, ready to have a laugh, doesn't take things very seriously, you know, give them a fair go type thing. But larrikins were pretty vicious criminals. <laughs> um, and they were particularly associated with this kind of hyper-masculinity and sexual assault as well. And so That's Ned completely Kelly... completely different to what we... Yeah. That's completely separate. Completely. And so that, that disconnect is one of the things I'm really interested in. How did... What is the history? And does that map onto... Or is it completely disconnected from what we think about it today? Yeah. And we're getting the, the, the wrap-up symbol, I'm afraid. Um, thank you. Please, um, please put your hands together and thank our panel. <laughs> I hope you've... Um,
you've had some good thoughts and things you're going to chew over. And remember that they are now about to go off and sign books. So you've got three great books that you can purchase. Christmas is coming up. So, um, yeah, th thank you.